To true crime rocket science. Trial day 11 was the verdict in the Patrick Frazee murder case. It came three days short of the one year anniversary of Kelsey's disappearance on Thanksgiving 22nd November 2018. The closing arguments are a time for everybody to reflect on the whole storyline going back to the beginning of the trial but also the beginning of the investigation and the, the whole narrative surrounding this particular incident. It's a time to reflect on the whole arc of the journey of the prosecution as well as the whole arc in terms of the defense. It's also an opportunity for um, journalists to reflect on the scale and scope of the crime. Um, it's, a, it's an opportunity for the media to basically, um, you know, it's sort of the climax of the trial and it's an opportunity for all the media to, um, you know, boost their boost their numbers um, you know there's a lot of buzz uh, on, on a day like this and as a result is once again a phalanx of cameras and reporters all sort of buzzing around um, the court there's a lot of energy there's a lot of anticipation there's a lot of anxiety there's a lot at stake um, it's also a opportunity for someone like me who, who was covering this um, uh, with the idea of the whole idea of me covering it was to engage with kind of a different audience to the Chris Watts crowd, um, not necessarily exclusively. Uh, I think some of the Chris Watts crowd have come along, but the whole idea being to introduce uh, myself to you guys, those following the Frazee case, um, introducing my standards of analysis and insight and uh, as a way to introducing as well um, the book that I'm working on. Now I could have brought the book out probably <coughs> would have been available um, today or tomorrow or certainly before the end of the week but very very close to the verdict had I not done these YouTube videos. Now I've also got to reflect on has this been a good exercise you know have you guys gotten good value out of it um, surely you've you've certainly just got the you know you could have read the tweets yourselves on Twitter you know so so isn't this just rehashing what you got from the media um, so I've had to be cognizant of that and at the same time it's the fine line between um, not rehashing that um, and then also not straying into the territory of murder most foul and I found that a little bit difficult especially given the fact that this case wasn't televised and that's the other aspect is because it wasn't televised the hype around this case the interest around this case is fairly moderate um, I think it's currently possibly the most high profile case in America right now um, but one could even argue that it's it's actually even lower profile than Chris Watts, just in terms of the amount of interest in total amount of interest in the case, the total amount of chatter in the case. Um, I, I would say the Frazee case is the most high profile current case, but uh, but in terms of total cases, I think I would say the Chris Watts case is still extremely um, talked about, extremely popular. Um, so yeah I, I wonder what you guys think I wonder what you guys think about you know should what would you prefer um, no coverage of these cases sort of in real time um, other than perhaps a couple of blogs and then a book coming out 
um, very very timely, very very soon, which I am able to do, or coverage and then the book coming out after a delay, after about a two week delay. How I rationalized it was um, because of my focus on the Chris Watts case, I <coughs> I felt a bit behind in terms of my knowledge of the Frazee case. I had I had um, you know I, ha I was following it, but I certainly didn't have a very very close laser-like focus on it. And so to sort of quickly appraise oneself, um, I didn't think was a very good idea. And the trial itself um, allowed me to become more familiar with everything, with the witnesses, um, with the individuals, with their identities with the crime scenes and so on and so um, that's how I've justified it to myself having said that um, you know had I researched um, on a daily basis over the course of the, the two-week trial um, you know I think I could have I could have done a reasonable job um, I just want to know what you guys think if you would have preferred no YouTube coverage and then a book or um, blogs and a book or um, or if you prefer this this way, you know, covering it on YouTube, giving it a sort of a a light touch, a little bit of insight into intertextualities, and then um, you know, and then um, taking the time from there to to deliver the book. With that being said, let's um, get to work with the. Um, trial day 11 obviously everyone listening to this video already knows the outcome um, we're not here to sort of discuss the the breaking news while the, you know so he was found guilty we, we here to follow the journey and then also to sort of interpret some of the little nuances in the journey and um, for me a big part of covering this case um, long before the trial um, very very early on was I wanted I always wanted to juxtapose this this case with the Chris Watts case um, because I think through doing that we get to know both um, criminals far far better and not only them we get to know their mistresses better we get to know criminal motives and criminal psychology a lot better by taking these two crimes separated only by a couple of months um, and a, a couple of miles we really get uh, a, a much more intimate um, feeling for um, for these cases individually and collectively and so in this particular episode I'm gonna expand on that a little bit more um, it's a um, unique feature of true crime rocket science this idea of true crime intertextuality um, it hasn't really caught on anywhere else I haven't heard any media talking about it I haven't heard it really being mentioned anywhere and as a result I think some people might think it's exotic fanciful dumb even um, you, you'll, you'll find in this episode um, just how powerful and how compelling uh, true crime intertextuality can actually be um, and and that's what we're going to deal with um, within this episode covering the trial narrative um, on the day of the verdict before we get there um, if you've enjoyed this channel if you're enjoying the, the, the coverage of the trial please subscribe like uh, ring the bell and please um, share your thoughts on what you think about the YouTube coverage, especially if you're a reader of the other um, True Crime Rocket Science books, if you've read the Chris Watts books, um, what would you prefer? Would you prefer more books coming out or do you like the idea of um, the sort of backstory and the, the journey covered sort of through YouTube commentary leading up to the eventual book, which do you prefer? Um, I'd really be interested to know. Um, so please leave a comment and uh, let's get started. Okay, so in terms of trial day 11, um, if the photos posted by Sam Kramer are accurate, the day dawned um, bright and glassy blue, um, the building 
glowed in that sort of early morning um, golden light. Um, I've also attended trial at a sandstone building somewhere else in the world and it's amazing how these buildings, these very old buildings glow, th how that sandstone really um, shines in the early light of the morning. You don't get the, the, the same almost magical quality in um, sort of new buildings such as um, some of the court buildings in Greeley and, and so on. Um, certainly adds an air of um, almost majesty and, and judicial power these these buildings. Um, I'm not saying the building in Cripple Creek is the best sort of court building for what it was designed to do but it certainly is a beautiful building. One journalist Kristen Scavira um, described the anticipation uh, building outside and that she counted 15 cameras. Um, I've also been part of the media scrum. Um, I've attended trials you know, up until um, verdict and sentencing and so on. And there definitely is an ebb and flow in, in trials. Um, there are times where the, the media can be down to really a skeleton crew, sometimes just one or two journalists. And then suddenly everyone's back and everyone is sort of interested in the case again. Uh, this case was quite um, unique in that it really held one's attention for the entire time and it was relatively short. And as the day wore on that clear blue sky became more cirrusy, more fuzzy and um, meanwhile the scenario was um, basically just closing arguments for the prosecution, closing arguments for the defense and then jury deliberation. Now, um, it was difficult to say before the time what was going to happen. I think there was still a possibility of a trial day 12 going into trial day 11. Um, but then it was decided that the prosecution would have 90 minutes to make their case or close their argument. And the defense would then be given the same amount of time. And then there would also be 30 minutes for... Um, uh, cross-examination or put it put it this way not cross-examination rebuttal rebuttal arguments so if we go to the prosecution's closing um, the district attorney spent about an hour laying out the timeline and evidence and he, he ended off saying the evidence compels you to one verdict and one verdict only and that is the defendant is guilty of first degree murder so that's very nicely sort of telling the jury uh, this is the situation and you compel to give this verdict obviously they're not but being told that is certainly going to guide the thinking processes one way or another it wasn't just Dan May that was um, addressing the jury uh, Beth Reed did the same one of the things she said uh, was you know do you know how much of the defendant's story is corroborated by any of the evidence and she then said zero, none. In fact, everything the defendant said is contradicted by the evidence. A very strong statement by Beth Reed. The prosecution stressed that Frazier had planned this, that it was a premeditated uh, murder, which, which is a first degree uh, offense, um, calculated, cold and cruel. Um, that, you know, while Beareth was planning a future, um, Frazier was planning her death. Uh, Jacob Rogers quoted um, Beth Reed saying, you know, we all wish Kelsey Barrett would walk through that door right now, but that's never going to happen. And that was kind of the subtext surrounding this entire trial, is that in order for Frazee to sort of be innocent, you, you need to have that sort of mind fuckery that, that Kelsey's actually still alive, that we don't know whether she's, she's died, um, she may actually be out there somewhere, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's the same kind of uh, mindfuckery in the Madeleine McCann case, that Madeleine might be out there, blah, blah, blah. Um, well, if she is, why doesn't she come forward, right? Same thing with Kelsey. He has a murder trial going on uh, for weeks. If she's out there, you know, where is she? Um, and obviously the evidence 
clearly shows that that's a ludicrous contention. Not only is there no activity on her phone, um, there there's plenty of evidence showing that she's no longer with us, unfortunately. And this was actually a very clever use of semantics by the prosecution, using Frazee's own words, you know, that, that she's never going to, um, you know, walk through that door. She's never coming back. That is literally what uh, Frazee said. And of course, if you remember, he said those words to uh, one of his clients. Um, you know, he was doing farrier work for Margaret Luce, and he said this to her on December 20th when, she was, when he was trimming her horse's hooves. According to Sam Kramer, um, Frazee knew Bereth uh, wouldn't show up in the days leading up to his arrest. Um, also referen referencing this thing of her never coming back in kind of a broader way. Um, Kramer then refers to Reed stressing the cell phone records tell the story and that, that is uh, very much the case. Um, he Kramer also refers to um, Reed's presentation um, about an hour long as powerful and this again just to emphasize is what the trial comes down to it comes down to presentation right at the end comes down to an eloquent compelling narrative that is um, anchored in the statements of the people involved um, and in you know making a strong case based on um, fact and based on a strong timeline and a strong narrative and that's what the prosecution did someone on twitter um, sort of summarized the outtake from the phrase trial as nobody no crime and then added how did that work for you patrick and um, that really in a way summarizes this entire case it's this idea of nobody no crime and and you know where the heck did Frazee get this idea? And um, you know the fact that think about you know if you sort of push the whole trial aside and push the knowledge aside of of what the outcome was, you have this hypothesis which is if there's no body there would be no crime. And um, I never believed that, but there was certainly an open question: without the body, would this guy be able to get away with this crime? And um, obviously, if there was a lot um, of, I if Crystal Kenny hadn't come forward, for example, and if there was um, very weak evidence otherwise, which I think there would have been if she didn't, it could have been a case of no body, no crime. But um, even without Crystal Kenny coming forward, the, the cell phone records are pretty damning. You know, and in this respect, there's also a kind of a a kind of a motive intertextuality with Chris Watts where you know he seemed to think um, you know why did he think that she went to a friend would fly you know wh why did he think that that statement would kind of work that that people would actually buy that it, it's the same kind of crazy statement that um, Frazee made thinking that for whatever reason um, he thought that this this sort of scenario would allow him to get away with with a crime and it didn't but where did he get that idea from one of the aspects highlighted um, by the prosecution was showing a photo bear in mind this was a presentation in court and part of the presentation was showing images and so one of them one of the images shown was a photo of Frazee's um, red truck after he apparently leaves um, Kelsey's home on Thanksgiving Day uh, in 2018. And Reed highlights the fact that the, the, the black toad box is in a different position. In other words, when he leaves the house, it's in a different position to when he actually arrived there. And that is um, very compelling. Sam Kramer uh, highlighted another aspect of Beth Reed's uh, closing argument, which is the argument around Crystal Kenny. No matter how much you disliked her or disputed what she said, 
um, it is quite a important thing to emphasize that she could have stayed silent she could have not said anything um, and while that's true uh, I'm not sure if it's strictly true in terms of she was certainly backed into a corner where you know I think if she had stayed silent she would be on trial herself and knowing what happened to Frazee she could well have been given um, pretty much the same sentence besides the solicitation aspect um, so if, if one looks at it in hindsight did Kenny make the right decision for herself clearly she did uh, of course th her story is not over um, the in terms of the prosecution she did as she um, she delivered I guess is the way to put it but um, she still needs to stand trial for her um, role and and that will be happening on December 2nd uh, we'll get to that towards the end of this video um, she was a very helpful witness uh, irrespective of how unhelpful she was in the beginning and she was unhelpful in the beginning um, and this in a way corresponds a little bit to Nicole Kessinger in the Watts case um, Kessinger may not have been completely forthright in the beginning or even throughout but she was certainly forthright enough for there to be a significant um, uh, sort of progress to be made in investigating um, Chris Watts in that case and the same thing happened in with the Frazee case um, what Kenny should be credited with is the fact that she told the um, law enforcement things that would subject to criminal prosecution so she, she went as far as to say you know I did this and this and this which actually made her culpable and that is um, something that is to her credit um, not a lot given of what went before but it, it certainly uh, amounted to a confession and amounted to certainly moments of honesty and moments of being genuine um, the other aspect to that of course is it, it wasn't um, purely altruistic as we know and that was essentially the biggest card held by the defense to say well she got a plea deal for that and even before she'd said everything that had happened so it was quid pro quo it was giving the truth in exchange for something which is very different to just simply giving the truth Jacob Rogers sort of provides more of a um, glossing over of this aspect and he simply says that Beth Reed tried to bolster the testimony of her star witness um, and then just sort of reminds uh, people that you know Lee endured well Kenny endured an aggressive cross-examination from Frazee's defense team that hit on her credibility and motivations for testifying by the way um, True Crime Rocket Science doesn't refer to Crystal Kenny as Lee because that is the surname of her husband and it's also kind of misleading. Um, her name before she got married was Crystal Kenny. It's the name you can see in that newspaper article. I think it's misleading to have her sort of take on her husband's surname and um, it's actually her ex-husband. So just to emphasize, you know, she was born Crystal Kenny. She married Chad Lee in October 2010. They had two children together. The marriage ended in divorce in June 2016. So to still call herself Crystal Lee is a bit misleading. Uh, during their marriage, they lived in an isolated six-bedroom farmhouse um, overlooking a canyon. This is in Kimberley, Idaho, which is not far from Twin Falls. Um, Kenny uh, pointed out the burn area at the Nash Ranch. That was a significant piece of evidence. Um, and the timeline police built uh, matches her story, which, um, which is a kind of a huge plus for the prosecution because if Kenny had continued to lie, then, then they would have been left with a broken story which wouldn't have been worth much. But as it happened, that, that her timeline and the locations and the timelines of the cell phones all um, kind of added up 
and um, in in contrast, Frazee's story didn't match that timeline at all. And um, w while identity uh, and, and psychology are some of the pillars of making a case, um, timeline is another essential pillar to a prosecution's case or or defence uh, case if if they have the stronger timeline. And then Ashley Franco tweeted that the prosecution had just finished up their closing arguments. Uh, Beth Reed with the DA's office had delivered the argument that everything that the defendant said contradicts the evidence. Now, this didn't really end their closing argument. I mean, technically they'd presented what they'd presented, but they would still um, continue to field an argument in rebuttal to the um, defense. So, and that was, as far as I'm concerned, that was some of the best um, um, of what the prosecution led on trial day 11, and we'll get to that. Elise Schmelzer sort of just provided some um, guidelines for what is about to happen next. The prosecutors had finished their closing arguments as early as the morning of the trial. Um, the defense would now present their arguments next and then the jury would deliberate. And this brings us to the defense closing. Um, in their closing arguments, Adam Steigerwald uh, blasted the prosecution in Jacob Rogers' words as having made up a case with an unbelievable witness. Um, Steigerwald referred to Frazee as a fool and an idiot, but not a murderer of Kelsey. Steigerwald went on to say that it's okay to make mistakes, but you can't build an entire case on it and refuse to acknowledge it. Um, and he said that's what has happened in this case. Um, true, but not, um, <laughs> not completely true. Um, to say that the prosecution made mistakes... Um, I think here he's referring to the um, chronology of the, the, that surveillance footage from Leslie Jackson. And so what the defense was saying here is, you know, some of those images appeared out of order. Um, you know, in some of them the light was different, the shadows were different. They were a little bit difficult to make out, as was the case in the... Chris Watts case, um, just the quality of what you were seeing wasn't very clear. And so they were basically saying, you know, you've built your entire case on this and, you know, you've refused to acknowledge that and and that's what happened here. Um, technically true, but not strictly speaking true. You know, what one could obviously infer from those images that, that while not clear, um, it's clear that something was happening you know, at a, at a very critical time. Um, and to argue that there's mistakes made here, well, even if the chronology wasn't, strictly speaking, exactly in order, um, that's not really a mistake. It's simply just a, um, a question of accuracy. It's not a mistake. It's not as though they were making something appear that it, it you know, wasn't um, correct. I mean, in hindsight, one can say that surveillance footage likely was Patrick Frazee on the scene when the crime happened. So that's not a mistake. You also can't say that they built the entire case on that surveillance footage because they built the entire case on the, re the, the entirety of the case. Does that make sense? But it is quite a strong statement which in a technical way is true from the defense and they didn't really have much to work with. So this wasn't a bad um, thing to sort of throw uh, at back at the prosecution. Uh, just coming back very quickly to this defense that, you know, Frazee is a fool and an idiot, but he's not a murderer. It reminds me a little bit of the Amanda Knox defense, which is that she's an oddball, she um, is very weird, she's goofy, uh, but that doesn't mean she killed Meredith Kirch. It's the, it's the same kind of facile argument. Steigerwald then went on to say, you know, you're being asked to ignore your common sense and the direct evidence. He said you, you li to listen to the circumstantial evidence that supports a story made up by C Crystal Kenny after she signed a plea deal, um, you know, isn't very clever. But that's also not true. Um, 
yeah they're referring to direct evidence as and it is direct evidence as dna evidence but of course um, direct evidence does not make a case it it often does make a case but without direct evidence you can have a very strong circumstantial evidence case which this case was and it's a misconception you know we we in the t in in a sort of a golden age of true crime now where it seems you know like you've got access to incredible technology and you've got access to um, you know incredible instruments that can pick up DNA and so it may seem as if, if there's no DNA there's no crime that's not true um, you can have again you can have a circumstantial evidence that the mosaic is so compelling that it leaves you with no other reasonable conclusion that's what happened here and so Frazee made that mistake is to think that if you take away the direct evidence there is no case well surprise surprise there is a case the same thing would actually have applied with the Chris Watts case um, in the sense of no direct evidence probably in his home potentially we don't know they, they probably there may have been direct evidence but there may not have been but in there in that case you would also have the direct evidence of the remains of his family in at the oil site and that would have been more difficult for him to explain and so in line with this issue of being asked to ignore your common sense um, comes a very interesting rhetorical question raised by the defense and the defense attorney asks why did Frazee decide to kill Kelsey on Thanksgiving Day of all days it's the worst plan anybody could come up with now in one sense that's absolutely true um, because on Thanksgiving you know people are with one another and so you you should have alibis and you should also have people um, how can I put it you can have people checking in with one another you know happy Thanksgiving but um, Frazee may have known that uh, and this is something I, I th I'm going to need to check on check on just to make sure when did Kelsey say to her mother happy Thanksgiving the other side is he could have taken her phone and sent those messages on her behalf as well in other words um, if, if it's a premeditated crime he may have thought that's a great way to have her live on after she died is that she's wishing people happy Thanksgiving um, and I believe one of the people she did do that with was her boss and I cover that in Murder Most Foul it's quite interesting the way that her boss sort of noticed that the semantics of the text didn't seem like Kelsey he, she always left emoticons for example and in that message which seems like a stage message um, uh, there, there weren't any so one could also argue it, it was the best plan which is that you know on Thanksgiving Day his own family could sort of say yeah he was with us he was having dinner with us now we don't know whether um, Frazee kind of became more estranged from his family um, as the lead up to the crime actually happened but um, as it turned out his brother testified against him or, or um, for the prosecutor's side and, and simply said that he arrived late for that dinner um, who knows if his mother uh, testified who knows what she would have said she may have said actually he didn't arrive that late you know we, we'll never know because she didn't testify but maybe Frazee um, figured that you know his family would cover for him or that there was some he could use Thanksgiving as a cover for himself and then uh, Sam Kramer quotes a very strong um, point made by the defense Steigerwald he spells it Steigerwald um, whereas Jacob Rogers spells it Steigerwald in any event he refers to there being no image of Frazee or Kenny that supports the prosecution's case in other words there's no f photo of Frazee or Kenny sort of going into or exiting um, Kelsey's home um, that's also a sort of a technically correct argument meaning there's no absolutely clear image of either of them going into the home 
and so technically that's a correct statement but but the other side is well there are vague images that seem to show a person that could be phrasy and that probably is phrasy entering or exiting and again you you could expect this kind of argument if the Chris Watts case went to trial that there is no image of Chris Watts walking out yes but there's an image of someone who looks like him and probably is him and who else could it be right and then he also notes that the tote is heavy empty and that Frazee couldn't move it quickly um, with it if a body was inside also technically true but he could move it slowly if there was a body inside and um, the other side is that Kelsey is quite small and quite slim and Frazee is quite big and quite strong and, and as a rancher he would have the strength to do that kind of thing, wouldn't he? Crane also refers to Steigerwald drawing attention to the fact that Kenny's DNA wasn't found uh, and that Frazee's was only found in small ratios at the crime scene, referring to Kelsey's apartment. So this is... Um, just pointing out that again that there's no direct evidence but again you don't need direct evidence there and why on earth would Kenny say that she was at the crime scene you know her phone is showing her moving it towards that location why would she say she was there if she wasn't there and then she's also given very clear reasons why th there's no DNA well because she used bleach and we know what um, was testified about bleach and also that she kind of dressed up like a spaceman you know when she cleaned the crime scene which also shows that it is possible to enter a crime scene be very busy inside it and exit without leaving DNA if you conform to those conditions incidentally just in terms of the spelling of Steigerwald um, you know if you go to ABC News the Daily Beast Washington Post KDVR um, NBC it's all spelled Steigerwald so I think it was just maybe a, a little bit of a slip from Sam Crane easy to do when you um, press for time in a court scenario Jacob Rogers then um, also emphasizes this idea of um, is there a day of the year this is quoting Adam Steigerwald is there a day of the year where people are less likely to be alone and less likely to be missed less likely to speak to your family and Thanksgiving Day. It's a good argument, but it's um, easily counted. But you know, it's a, it's a good argument to put into the minds of the jury. Uh, another tweet, uh, again quoting Steigerwald, is if it's your plan to murder someone, you don't tell half the people you know. Um, Frazee came off like a complete and total fool. That doesn't make him guilty. Well, it can, and in this case, it did. But that certainly does raise the question, um, if Frazee did plan to murder someone, and he did, um, why did he tell half the people he knew? Um, and that is a very interesting question. Uh, that's a question I'm dealing with in Murder Most Foul, and there is an answer to it. Um, one can argue to some extent that it does make him a complete and total fool, but one must also counter that and say in terms of criminal psychology what is he actually trying to do here and there is an answer to that uh, I'm not going <laughs> to reveal it here but there is a it is a question that one needs to address why would he tell so many people about what he was planning to do Sam Kramer also highlights this aspect that Frazee had been planning this for months and we know that he'd been planning it at least from April 2018 so almost six months th this crime was sort of in his mind and he couldn't uh, Thanksgiving was sort of seems like the cutoff date six months later that was absolutely when he couldn't stop himself the temptation was just too great not to not commit the crime um, Steigerwald refers to it being the worst plan in the world um, and, he, and this is a good point he says you know, Frazee could have killed Beareth the night prior at the Nash Ranch in the middle of nowhere. And that's a very good point is, you know, why didn't he? And I'll give you a very simple reason why. <laughs> because the next day was Thanksgiving and she would be immediately missed, you know, under those circumstances. And in a sense, so would uh, Frazee. If he was um, busily having to cover up, you know, get rid of her rem remains, 
you know that night um, that that could also be a problem and so um, not only that he also needed an accomplice to be prepped and ready and on her way and at that point um, Kenny wasn't so there are quite a few reasons why it couldn't have been done that night even though um, that argument does is valid in terms of it would have been a better location but the timing wasn't right and this brings us to a fascinating intertextuality one of two major intertextualities I'm only going to be dealing with one of them and very quickly and lightly and that is the um, the standout feature of the Frazee case is the extraordinary lengths that the convicted murderer went went to to get rid of Kelsey's remains. The standout feature um, of this case, I mean so much so that those words have made headlines across multiple platforms. It was obviously mentioned in court as words that Frazee used uh, to Joseph Moore, uh, his uh, neighboring rancher, in April 2018. And so we can even date the time of the, the statement to, you know, six months before the crime happened. Um, this idea was in Frazee's mind. No body, no crime. Where did this idea come from? And it's easy to say, well, he simply got this idea in his head, but ideas do come from somewhere. And that's when we go into the very um, specialized area of criminal psychology. How did this guy get this criminal intent? Where did it come from? And so I have a theory. I can't prove it. Um, but I have a, a very strong theory, a very strong suspicion that Frazee got his inspiration from Casey Anthony. You may recall that 2018 was the 10-year anniversary of the Casey Anthony case and Kaylee's disappearance. The case was exceptional in that a lot of people felt she got away with murder and it was also exceptional because there was this situation of uh, the child disappearing for an extended period of time and nobody knowing whether she was alive or dead. And so there was this inference through that that if if Kaylee's body had never been found Casey would never have been found guilty of anything I think that was the takeout for someone watching that with um, kind of a similar intent a, an intent to get rid of someone and so if you google Casey Anthony documentary 2018 you come up with quite a few mainstream um, mediums covering the Casey Anthony case in 2018. There were not only documentaries but there was also a lot of media coverage in tabloids like People magazine and major uh, news agencies like CNN and so on. And then you had extended coverage in a series of let's call them episodes from let's say A&E that was covered both online and on television. There was Marsha Clark in March on March 30th. Um, there were the biggest revelations from Cindy and George um, on May 29th. And you can see that Frazee coming up with this idea of nobody, no crime falls square between those dates. Between March 30th and May 29th is April, right? And that's when he got the idea. Um, May 31st, there's a podcast uh, also talking about Xanax and you know still going on about it and this was going on really throughout the year Hulu uh, made available a Casey Anthony um, documentary series an American murder mystery but more pertinently the case of Kaylee Anthony came out on the 19th of May 2018 a TV movie now again people can dismiss this and argue this and talk about well this date or that date the fact is it was the anniversary of uh, the, the Kaylee's disappearance in 2018 that's a fact and the reason it resonates so much with me um, the reason I'm making such a big deal of it was I was writing um, a book on Casey Anthony in early 2018 when the Chris Watts case happened 
in fact if you go and look at the publication date of treachery the first one is July the 5th and the second is August the 28th so you can see in the summer of 2018 I was covering um, Casey Anthony because of the incredible hype and the sort of resurgence of interest in Casey Anthony in 2018 but especially in the middle of 2018 and so when does Frazee also get this idea in his mind well April 2018 early in 2018 and it's not as though he got the idea and executed it he got the idea and it stayed with him and then he fine-tuned the idea over a period of months and bear in mind with the Casey Anthony case Casey Anthony was ultimately acquitted there was the situation of the child disappeared when the remains were found it was inconclusive there wasn't really evidence and so if was Frazee looking at this case and so there was some coverage for example from A&E um, asking Marsha Clark for example what is the biggest piece of evidence that was overlooked during the case and so someone trying to commit a crime and getting away with it would, would look at stuff like that what was you know overlooked w um, what did this person get away with potentially so I'm not going to go into it any further than that but um, like I said I've got a very strong suspicion that Frazee um, was inspired by the circumstances around Casey Anthony um, and then there's also I think he was very much um, educated and guided I think by the events of the Watts case which were playing out in the immediate lead up to the murder of, of Kelsey Barrett. Coming back to trial day 11 um, the defense then rested Dan May uh, was given 30 minutes for a rebuttal um, and he, he said basically that the defense is asking the jury to speculate instead of actually looking at the facts and that was quite a simple but strong counter Sam, Cr Sam Kramer highlighted the fact that May had said Kenny's plea bargain, whether anyone likes it or not, uh, was built on her telling the truth. Her story is corroborated by evidence. She is direct evidence. She is Patrick Frazee's witness, which is a, a, a strong statement, very well expressed. And this brings us to some of the most memorable comments made by the prosecution, I think, in the whole trial statements like this and, and this one again is quoting May Sam Kramer quoting May saying he took a bat into Kelsey's apartment and he beat her 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 and in some point in that the victim says will you please stop very powerful and this statement is related to the tweet of the day which I'll get to in a second but it's this re repetition of he beat her and you know her words that again are attributed to Frazee which he told to Kenny you know that that Kelsey said will you please stop in the middle of him executing this crime and that was it um, Elie Schmelzer um, noted very um, insightfully that the defense didn't address the phone location data that showed um, Kelsey and, and Frazee's phone traveling together after Thanksgiving after the last time Frazee said he saw Kelsey so that was a very damning bit of information and something that Frazee couldn't really deal with and it just shows he may have been quite clever with disposing of the remains but he seemed to have totally miscalculated the um, technologies that are out there that can recover cell phone data that can that can track um, the movements of a cell phone and so fairly early um, at 11 18 a.m. Um, the people of the state of Colorado versus Patrick Frazee the case um, was handed over to the jury um, a nice tweet from Kramer just giving the exact time that this happened and so from then on everyone sort of sat tight uh, awaiting the verdict the anticipation was sort of building uh, the sort of seriously clouds are sort of um, sparking over the court building um, over the you know over the journalists uh, kind of in the sky almost like f feathers and um, Jennifer Ko Kovaleski um, 
describe the defense wrapping up their closing arguments in about 30 minutes so very short um, uh, but also quite potent um, counter um, potent given how little they actually had to work with um, their biggest argument was that the timeline was made up and created by investigators to fit um, Kenny's story um, quite a clever little ruse to to um, stimulate reasonable doubt but given the mosaic that the prosecution had so put together so well and given the absence of a proper counter um, not not a very convincing um, statement overall and then uh, maybe about an hour into the jury deliberations um, the jury had a question and um, the prosecutors and defense attorneys then uh, headed back into court and this was obviously a closed session without the media present and it was later made clear that the jurors had asked to see f um, the photo of Frazee entering Kelsey's condo on November the 22nd again this is from the neighbor um, Jackson's surveillance camera now bear in mind again that the defense said well there was no um, no photo of him but that was a, 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 a bit of a tricky use of semantics uh, n not a verifiable photo but certainly it is a photo and so some members of the jury wanted to have a look at that and um, you know were probably arguing a little bit amongst themselves you know um, it wasn't necessarily him and then they would then look at that photo and say well who else could it be right the other aspect I is, and this is quite an interesting aspect, is that the prosecutors said that you know he, he was hiding a baseball bat in a sweatshirt, um, and so you know you could sort of make the argument that maybe there's a photo of Frazee at the time, but he wasn't carrying any kind of weapon. So you know, so isn't that reasonable doubt? Um, so the defense in that respect said he didn't have anything in his, in his hand. Um, but bear in mind it's not really the prosecutor saying that he hit the baseball bat in a sweatshirt it's actually Kenny who said that it's Kenny who said that Frazier had told her that so again it's his own words coming back to haunt him I mean this is potentially a um, verdict changing point and, and um, Frazier had sunk himself by actually telling Kenny everything just you know literally not being able to keep his trap shut if you consider the craziness around the Chris Watts case around this particular vague surveillance footage um, you could have had the same thing around this without Kenny saying very very simple explanation and it one that makes sense of the baseball bat and his sweatshirt I mean why on earth would he carry the baseball bat in his hand kind of in plain sight why, why would he sort of get out his um, truck and carried in plain sight. Not only could neighbors see him doing it, like literally, um, you know, eyewitnesses just standing around, but the cameras, you know, the surveillance cameras could see it. But m most important of all, Kelsey would have seen it. She would have been like, What are you carrying a baseball bat for? Um, you know, wh wh what are you doing with that? And so Clayton Sandell um, also referred to this aspect, um, the jury wanting to see security uh, camera f footage of Frazee leaving the condo. And so the jury continued to um, review the evidence and pour over the um, various arguments. And the question was really, you know, was this guy some kind of murderous manipulator or a victim of, of one woman's lies uh, you know which one was it you know, is he a manipulating murderer or, or did someone tell vicious lies about him that aren't true which one was it Carol McKinley provided a little bit of color um, to the pause the, the, the tense sort of calm b before the storm in terms of be you know the period just before the verdict um, where the journalists were I guess chatting to the court staff and she refers to um, the great grandma sheriff's deputy who, who makes sausage and pancakes for the entire staff on a, on a griddle in the center of the courthouse 
she says it smelled pretty good so yeah that that is one of the things you don't see as um someone who's not there um those little nuances um but you know in the in the pauses between sessions um the often characters who are very much part of the fabric of these um trials and it sort of gives it a weird um normality is that y you sort of th have these people who who are ever present during these cases no matter which ones they are um meanwhile you have you know the media sort of coming and going like tides and murder is coming and going like tides and there's the sense that these people are monsters but they're actually just part of the ordinary ebb and flow of criminality through society and it uh, may seem um a horrible statement to say that that crime isn't normal but it is it's um it's not normal in the sense that it's right but it's it's common and it's it's part of um our society unfortunately and so three hours went by sam kramer referred to this passage of time with no verdict rob quirk from koaa um, provided an image just of the media phalanx um you know almost like a battalion of of um soldiers sort of um facing the court the lenses trained towards the front door of the, of the court building and even then you can see this is prior to the um uh the announcement of a guilty verdict he was already sort of alluding to there being a guilty verdict and that's something else that happens is that the journalists sort of speculate amongst themselves um yet definitely guilty maybe it'll be first some will say second or whatever and obviously they can't really make these sort of statements in public um because of you know prescriptions and protocols from the the companies that they belong to and so Clayton Sandell from ABC was one of the first to start I wouldn't say speculating but he he said um a source says there is a verdict in the Frazee trial not saying what the verdict was but simply that um there is a verdict and so kudos to Nikki Batista um from CBS she broke the news that the jury had found Frazee guilty of first degree murder in the death of his fiance This was followed by Danielle Shavira and um she's also sort of referred to um she just showed an image of all the of all the media um but the same thing just reiterating guilty of first degree murder and so various other entities then just repeated the same thing I've always found it crazy as a I mean I've sat in on these trials myself you have a situation where you've got dozens of cameras all taking basically the same photo dozens of photos all in the same location directed to the same object and essentially seeing the same thing and saying the same thing i mean how many different news agencies do you need to to sort of say the same thing of course it is the nature of the news media today but um when you actually sit there it does seem a bit ridiculous you know don't you only need one messenger to tell you um you know that the person's guilty or not um of course um you know y each news agency needs their own um source so th that's the reason for that but in terms of resources it, it just seems kind of a waste uh, a waste of manpower to have so many people covering the same thing from the same point of view with the same kind of answer And so something that was I guess quite interesting was um the jury took about three and a half hours to reach their verdict. Um I was asked following when I posted trial day ten, I was asked on YouTube how long I thought the jury would deliberate. Very hard to say. Um you don't know who these individuals are, um, but I guessed between three and four hours and so it was three three and a half hours. So effectively Frazee was sentenced to prison life in prison without parole plus 156 years um during sentencing Cheryl had said he not only killed our daughter 
but he chose a horrible death for her. Absolutely true. It wasn't just a murder, not that a murder is ever just a murder, but it was a particularly heinous, cruel, terrible crime, this one. Elie Schmelzer highlighted the fact that this was the maximum consecutive sentence for every count, which shows you the prosecution did their job and also that the jury did their job. It also raises the question, if it had been a death penalty case, would Tracy have gotten the death penalty while well, these maximum consecutive sentences seem to suggest that he could have. I really like Lance Benzel's coverage. I mean, even after the trial was effectively over, he just provides a lot of little sort of snippets just filling in the the total story. And so he refers to deputies still making efforts to shield Frazee from the media, even doing a wide turn in the street to block the view from whenever he comes out. Um, and he refers to someone from the media from the reporter gaggle shouting he's a convicted murderer now you know like why are you protecting his and um, that is a good question is a good question why um, the law enforcement were trying so hard to shut the media out of this case and then Benzel again refers to himself standing next to Sheila Frazee's driver window and asking her for comment this is Frazee's mother and says she just stared straight ahead and drove off. No visible emotion. When Benzel approached Kelsey's mother, she said she only had contempt, um, just saying she, she had no, she couldn't understand how he could beat um, the mother of, of you know, his 13-month-old daughter, um, wrecking her life, wrecking the little girl's life, uh, and tainting Thanksgiving. And this brings us to the tweet of the day from Sam Kramer where he refers to what the prosecution said. We are asking you to please stop this defendant from getting away with murder and find him guilty on all charges. And the reason why this is such an excellent um, comment from May is because he's referring to the victim's own words. Please stop this defendant. Very, very effective closing. And so as much as the case is closed, as much as the case is dealt with and, and sort of over, uh, there may be an appeal. Uh, we'll, it remains to be seen if there will be. But there, there's also the um, unfinished business of um, Crystal Kenny. What's going to happen to her? KKTV News um, provided some coverage on uh, Kenny um, after the verdict just saying that um, Dan may sort of admitted we did a deal with the devil but but then he said there's no question Kelsey wouldn't have had justice today without making that deal and so you can kind of understand the prosecution's situation they really wanted to get Frazee they needed Kenny to do it and they were desperate um, and so they did a desperate thing and it, it has paid off. Um, the question now is what is going to happen to Kenny? I mean she's not innocent in this, not by a long shot. And so her next court appearance is slated for December 2nd for a review hearing. So the case isn't over. If you've enjoyed the coverage on YouTube of this case, um, please go and visit crimerocket.com for coverage of many other cases. Um, follow. You can follow me on Twitter at Crime Rocket, and also there's a Facebook group. Um, I provide sort of ongoing news on the books that I've written, and also cases that I'm covering there. So if you're interested in being part of this community, uh, please um, join those those groups. And look out for Murder Most Foul, um, likely to be out before the end of November. Thank you for listening.